How often do we hear terms such as semiconductors, rare earth metals and critical minerals in today's world? Far too often, right? Almost as if our life depended on it. The fact is, modern life does depend on these things. They are everywhere, from cars to electronic devices, nuclear energy, you name it. We've already discussed the centrality of semiconductors in a previous episode of Everybody's Business. I'll leave the link to the video in the description box below. And in this edition, we'll turn our focus to rare earth minerals. But before we proceed, I have an appeal to make. The print won the support of discerning viewers and readers like you because of its responsible and high quality granular coverage. But this quality of journalism requires resources. And that means we need viewers and readers like you to consider taking subscriptions to support our work. Subscriptions to the print come with a host of special privileges which you can find in the description below. I urge you to support us and help us produce more quality work. Coming back to today's topic, why rare earths and why now? Because of many factors largely revolving around geopolitics, trade and economy. As recently as April this year, China, which controls 90% of the world's rare earths, put the squeeze on. It drastically restricted exports in retaliation to Trump's tariffs and strong currents were felt in India. Trump also struck a deal with Japan and other countries are busy trying to reduce their dependence on China to counter its dominance. We'll talk in detail about how they are doing it, but first, let's start with the basics. Let's discuss what rare earths really are and are they really that rare? Rare earths are a basket of 17 naturally occurring elements located in the earth's crust. Though they are relatively abundant, their mineable concentrations are way less common than for most other minerals. Now, 15 of these elements form the lanthanide series and then there's yttrium and scandium. Other than scandium, all rare earths are divided into heavy and light categories based on, on their atomic weight. Stay with me here, let's look at the periodic table on your screen. See that separate line marked in orange at the bottom? That's the lanthanide series from lanthanum La to lutetium Lu. Now, there's a debate between scientists on whether lanthanum should be counted in this or not, but we won't get into that technicality. Because all these 15 elements behave so similarly, they occur together in the same minerals and are difficult to separate. And other than these, you can see yttrium Y and scandium SC from group 3 also marked in orange. Yttrium and scandium are included with the rare earths because like the lanthanides, they have very similar ionic sizes and bonding behavior. And hence, they occur with them in the same mineral deposits and require similar separation processes. Scandium is notable because it's much rarer in workable co concentrations and is valued for producing ultra-light, high-strength aluminium scandium alloys used in aerospace and advanced manufacturing. Together, all these rare earths are crucial for high-tech applications such as powerful magnets, phosphor displays, lasers and optics, energy and defense materials. Now, if you look at the first eight elements with lower atomic numbers, which are lanthanum, cerium, praseodymium, neodymium, promethium, samarium, europium, and gadolinium, these are classified as light rare earth elements. Neodymium is considered one of the most critical. It is used in everything from mobile phones and electric cars to medical equipment. It's also the main light rare earth used in the creation of very strong permanent magnets. Praseodymium, meanwhile, is used in alloys with magnesium to form aircraft engines and it also finds use in the film industry for studio lighting and other projects. This also plays a role in creating permanent magnets. The following seven, which are terbium, dysprosium, holmium, erbium, thulium, ytterbium, and lutetium, and yttrium from group 3 are considered heavy rare earth elements. Yttrium groups with the heavy ones because of its ionic size, but scandium falls out of this categorization. The heavy rare earths are less common and some of these are also facing shortages as demand outpaces supply. Heavy rare earths are generally more sought after for use in defense and medical applications and are also used in electric vehicles and windmills. Now, we've already discussed how the term rare earths is a bit of a misnomer. The concentration of the rare earths in the earth's crust is as high as some other elements, including that of copper. 
The only difference is that the rare earths do not occur as separate minerals easy for exploration and mining and are widely distributed across the earth's surface. And unlike base metals like iron, copper and aluminium, rare earths were not in use in great demand throughout much of human existence. As a result, not much attention was paid to their exploration, extraction and purification. But they have risen in importance with their role in many important industries such as electronics, petroleum and clean energy. Now, why throw around generic terms like electronics and clean energy? Let's look at a few specific applications of rare earths. The magnets developed from them are used in computer hard drives, disk drive motors, anti-lock brakes, automotive parts including for EVs, frictionless bearings, refrigeration, microwave power tubes, power generation, microphones and speakers, communication systems and MRI, among others. The metal alloys are used in things like batteries, fuel cells, steel, super alloys, etc. Their catalysts are used in petroleum refining, catalytic converters, fuel additives, chemical processing and air pollution controls. In the form of glass and polishing, they are used in polishing compounds, pigments and coatings, UV resistant glass, photo optical glass and x-ray imaging. In ceramic form, they are used in capacitors, sensors, colorants, etc. And in terms of phosphors, they find use in display phosphors, CRT, LCD, fluorescence, medical imaging, lasers and fiber optics. But how and why exactly are they used in these components? Here's why. Rare earths are valuable because they can change the behavior of materials in very precise ways. They fit neatly into crystal structures without causing damage or distortion. This lets scientists use them like fine-tuning tools inside metals, magnets, glass and electronic components. For example, neodymium and dysprosium help make very strong magnets that stay powerful even when very hot, essentially in EV motors, wind turbines, aircraft and headphones. Europium and terbium give pure bright colors to screens and LEDs, lanthanum improves optical glass for high quality camera lenses and yttrium and gadolinium help in lasers and medical imaging. No other elements can replace their unique magnetic, light based and heat resistant properties. Without rare earths, much of modern electronics, clean energy technology and advanced aerospace and defense would not function as efficiently or at all. And where do these rare earths come from? How are they mined and how are they refined for use? These elements are either mined from open pits like many other metals and minerals or they are mined through in situ leaching. In situ leaching is a mining method where minerals are dissolved right into the ground without digging the ore out. A chemical solution is pumped into the ore body. The solution dissolves the target mineral underground and then the mineral rich liquid is pumped back up. The mineral is then extracted from the solution at the surface. The open pit mining process is similar to that of other minerals. Basically, hard rock is mined, ore is separated and then it is refined. The rare earth metals are found in hard rock deposits, ionic clay deposits and mineral sands. Rare earths mining has a final step which is the separation of the different rare earths from each other. However, because the rare earth elements all have similar chemical behavior to each other, they are very difficult to separate, particularly when separating the light ones from the heavy ones. So, to put it a little too simply, rare earths are then processed using techniques such as electrolysis or vacuum distillation to separate and purify the individual rare earth elements. So, that's the science and the application part of rare earths. Let's not forget that this is an episode of everybody's business. So let's get down to business. Why are the world's biggest countries talking about rare earths right now? With urgency and somewhat concern at that. The one word answer is China. China has been the major supplier of rare earths all over the world. Even though it has only about 40% of the global rare earth resources, it has captured the worldwide market of more than 90%. The low cost and efficient production process enabled China to monopolize the rare earth market, forcing similar operations around the world to close down, including in India. Now, in recent years, China began building on this monopoly. It first imposed restrictions and curtailed export of rare earths by over 30%, citing domestic increased demand. 
According to Carriage, a subsidiary of Care Ratings, one of the earliest signs of China using this as a power play was when it temporarily cut off exports to Japan during a diplomatic dispute in 2010. It then introduced changes to the export control law in 2020 to introduce curbs covering elements that affect national security. It also banned some exports to the US in December 2024. And then, on April 4 this year, it announced additional export controls on seven items related to medium and heavy rare earth elements. These policy shifts highlight the vulnerability of the supply chain, which is heavily skewed towards a single nation. It also highlights the urgency for diversification given the growing global demand for rare earths. If we look at other key players, the US holds 2.1% of the world's reserves and is contributing 12% to global mining production, making it the second largest producer after China. Still, it relies heavily on imports from China, accounting for nearly 70% of its rare earths. Countries like Australia are playing an increasingly important role too. Australia holds approximately 6% of the world's total known reserves and it accounts for 4% share of global mining production. Another key region, according to the CARE report, is the Arctic. Greenland hosts some of the world's largest undeveloped deposits of rare earths and is strategically located in the global supply chains. And this has led to heightened interest from the US, China and the European Union in the region. South Africa and Brazil are also emerging players in this domain. And when we talk about India, the picture is promising but still challenging. India holds about 6% of the world's reserves but contributes less than 1% of the global rare earths mining. Earlier this year, the Indian government launched the National Critical Minerals Mission to build India's self-reliance. As of the 2023 Indian Minerals Yearbook, India had recognized 130 deposits of which coastal states such as Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Andhra Pradesh and Odisha have the most deposits. The recent curbs by China on rare earth exports have made Indian Rare Earths Limited or IREL a central government undertaking consider reducing its exports to save rare earths in the home country and expand domestic processing. So, that's a bit of a global status check. But what's happening in the current scenario and where is the geopolitics taking this issue? In April this year, China imposed export restrictions on 7 out of the 17 rare earths. And all these 7 rare earths are designated critical minerals by India. India sourced 93% of its rare earths from China in 2024-25. And as Beijing introduced these curbs, many countries including the US were hit. If we talk about the India impact, Bajaj Auto had to slash production of its electric two-wheelers by up to 50% in July amid the deepening global shortage of heavy rare earth magnets. The automaker said it expected output to remain constrained in the coming months, even as the supply squeeze began affecting production in June. And Bajaj wasn't the only one to be hit. TVS Motors recently said that had rare earth magnets been available freely, the industry would have reported higher sales. Maruti was also forced to cut its near-term production targets for its Vitara EV due to rare earth supply constraints. Bajaj says it has redesigned certain motors to use light rare earth magnets and has been reworking supply. It told Al Jazeera that the changes helped the company recover close to half of its planned July output for electric two-wheelers and it expected to reach about 60% during August and September. Do note that vehicles that run on petrol and diesel also use rare earth magnets but in very small quantities. The impact on the EVs comes at a time the Indian sector was showing promising growth. EV sales crossed 20 lakh for the first time in 2024 and this was up 24% from the 2023 sales. Two wheelers led the segment with the sale of 12 lakh units last year. On August 19, as a thaw in the bilateral ties between India and China was setting in, Beijing said that it would ease export restrictions on rare earths. The announcement came after External Affairs Minister S. Jaishankar's meetings in Beijing. And in late October, China resumed supplying heavy rare earth magnets to India after six months, providing much needed relief to EV companies, renewable energy and consumer electronics sectors. But this didn't come without conditions. China said that these magnets couldn't be re-exported to the US and they couldn't be used for military purposes. 
While the exports were said to have resumed to four companies, ET reported that many other applications were still pending approvals. And even as all of this was happening, China dealt another blow to the rare earth supply to the world. China's Bureau of Security and Control expanded export curbs to include centrifugal extraction equipment for rare earth processing and intelligent continuous impurity removal and precipitation equipment for ionic rare earth ores. Essentially, it also put controls on equipment used to extract and refine the rare earth metals. Now, while India and China are in closer talks lately and an easing of the situation could be expected, India has made a move to reduce its dependence on China. Financial dailies reported recently that a key government panel had approved a 7300 crore rupee scheme to support sourcing rare earths locally. The report said that the Expenditure Finance Committee, which is under the Finance Ministry, cleared the proposal and that the scheme aimed to give both capital and operational support to companies. The Union Steel and Heavy Industries Minister H.D. Kumaraswamy had earlier said that the government was working on incentives to increase domestic output. India is rapidly boosting its rare earth strategy even as part of the National Critical Minerals Mission. From lithium that powers electric vehicles to the rare earths vital for defence systems, the National Critical Minerals Mission casts its net wide. Do leave a comment below if you'd like me to do a separate video on the critical minerals and this mission. Now, experts say that there's another aspect that India needs to focus on. That India urgently needs to reorganize the decades-old Indian Rare Earths Limited, which was set up to focus on nuclear fuel extraction with rare earths as byproducts. Currently, IREL is the only significant producer of rare earths and it also refines rare earth oxides. However, the output is very low and India lacks the capability to process oxides into magnets, which is a highly complex and technical process. But where did this latest flashpoint on rare earths originate? Obviously, how can anyone keep Donald Trump out of any discussion on geopolitics? In April, China placed export restrictions on rare earth elements to directly hit back at Trump's tariffs. And the move affected exports to all countries. It showed China's capability to leverage its dominance over the mining and processing of these minerals. While the export controls stopped short of an outright ban, Beijing can very easily dry up shipments by restricting the number of export licenses it issues. And then, on October 30, came a big move. The US president said that he and his Chinese counterpart Xi Jinping had agreed for a one-year deal on the supply of crucial rare earths. Trump said that he had also agreed to reduce fentanyl-related tariffs to China to 10% as the two leaders met in person in South Korea after six years. Trump said that all the rare earths had been settled and that was for the whole world. But this came only after Trump made another important move on rare earths. The US and Japan have agreed to a deal on new generation nuclear power reactors and rare earths as both look to reduce China's dominance. In Japan, Trump signed a framework ag agreement for securing the supply of rare earths. We've already discussed how several countries are trying to reduce their dependence on China. Australia is investing in mining and refining facilities. Canada is focusing on lower impact mining and recycling. Brazil is working on surveying and mapping deposits more systematically. South Africa is working on reviving and upgrading old rare earth projects and Europe is trying to build shared processing and magnet manufacturing hubs across countries. The common theme is diversifying sources and adding processing capacity, not just extraction. For now, Trump and Xi appear to have dialed it down. They have announced an understanding on rare earths and it appears that exports from China could pick up in the coming weeks and months. But we all need to keep one thing in mind. It's Trump and Xi. And no one can really say when the next flashpoint would emerge, sending ripples across the world.